In August 1994, nine-year-old Diana Rabolla left her house in Houston, Texas, and headed to a grocery store to buy some sugar. But she would never return home. There was no Diana. There was nothing. Nobody saw her or did anything. Eventually, you know, her body was found in a horrific fashion. Diana had become the third casualty of a twisted sexual predator named Anthony Shaw, a man who would abduct, rape, and then strangle the life out of his victims. He's got this tourniquet. He's just driving around with it in his glove box all the time. When the urge strikes him, and he's always just one insult away from killing a woman. Years later, Shaw's confessions would stun investigators who were just beginning to find out about his terrifying history of rape and murder. I remember I opened her blouse and she was resisting. And I was going to have her regardless. I don't know what the hell you call it. I wanted to possess her somehow. Anthony Shaw had gone on record and revealed himself as one of the world's most evil killers. In October 2003, telephone repairman Anthony Shaw sat down with detectives in Houston, Texas, and confessed to four murders and the rape of a 14-year-old girl. What's your name for the tape, Tony? Anthony Allen Shaw. Sure. Okay. I'm going to call you Tony. Yes, sir. The 41-year-old father of two had only been captured because his DNA remained on file after he was convicted of sexually assaulting his own daughters. Despite his shocking crimes, Shaw didn't come across as a deranged killer. He could be sitting in this room with you and me, and if he didn't open his mouth, we would think he was just like us. He was an average-looking guy. He wasn't ugly, he wasn't handsome, he wasn't tall, he wasn't short, he wasn't fat, he wasn't skinny, he was just a very average-looking man. And if you put a hard hat on him, and a Southwestern Bell shirt on him, you would think uh, that uh, you could take him to Sunday dinner. Locked the door so she couldn't get out. It got out of hand, and she freaked out, and I knew this was gonna be real bad, and my life was fucked forever. His victims were young, vulnerable, slight of build, couldn't protect themselves, couldn't fight, couldn't run, scream, yell, or fight back, and that's who he preyed upon. Of Shaw's four victims, three of them were children, the youngest being just nine years old. I'm sorry, anyone who kills a nine-year-old girl and sexually assaults them and just leaves their body, anyone of that magnitude to me is the lowest of the lowest. You know, there's reasons that we have the death penalty, and Anthony Shaw would be a poster child for why we do have the death penalty. This killer's story begins on the 25th of June, 1962. Anthony Allen Shaw was born in Rapid City, South Dakota. Both his parents worked in the military and his father's career led to a fairly transient childhood. Shaw moved around a lot when he was a child and an adolescent, and the reason for this moving around was his father's job. So I think this has two impacts. Firstly, it has an effect on how able he is to maintain relationships with peers, because he never really gets a chance to do that. And secondly, he gets a bit of a message sent to him subliminally through this, in that dad's job is the reason why we're moving. So dad's position is what determines what we do. And this kind of reinforces a, a sort of patriarchal way of, of looking at the world, that actually life revolves around what men are doing and we just follow where they go. Even at a young age, Shaw began to display worrying signs of what would come later in his life. When Shaw was about four or five years old, he um, took a knife and killed a cat. 
It was a neighbor's cat, and he was upset that the cat kept trying to go home, and he wanted the cat to be with him. So I took a knife and killed the cat. And psychologists will tell you that children in particular who do great harm to domestic animals, that's not a good sign, not a good sign at all. Shaw's disturbing behavior continued as the family moved back and forth across the country. He attacked his sister with a screwdriver when he was 10. And from about the age of 10 onwards, he would encourage his younger sister, they used to ride their bikes together, to knock on the doors of girls in the local neighborhood and invite them out, and then he would grope them. So this shows us how kind of manipulative and, and how premeditated he was, even at an incredibly young age. He's involving his sister in, in getting access to what were essentially victims. So he's involving other people in his ruse. So this shows a level of, of manipulation and planning that is very chilling for someone this young. As Shaw grew up, his parents grew apart and eventually divorced. Essentially, what had already been a fairly kaleidoscopic childhood became even more fractured. He didn't know where he was. Eventually, he finds himself back in Houston, Texas. But I believe looking for some kind of roots, looking for somewhere to be, uh, somewhere to feel at home, By 1985, 22-year-old Anthony Shaw had settled down. He was married with two children and working as a telephone repairman. I mean, he was about as nondescript as you can get. I mean, he's you, you, like the proverbial person next door. You're not going to think twice about Anthony Shaw. He was, to some extent, this apparently proper man. He had a job. They had a house, there were children, but there was something off about him. In September 1986, Anthony Shaw killed for the first time. He gave an account of the attack years later, where he claimed he'd struck up a friendship with 15-year-old schoolgirl, Laurie Lee Tremblay. I'm working for Southwestern Bell as a marketing representative. Every morning, I leave and go to work. One morning, this girl comes up and asks me for a cigarette while I was at the stoplight. She needed a ride. She and I became more than friends, and that's not why it's stick in the fucking head because I understand she was not of age. She and I became involved just in the sense of kissing, that, you know, hello, goodbyes. He befriended her, and she got comfortable with him. And then the fateful day where the weather was bad, he stops, picks her up to give her a ride to school, and uh, makes some sexual advances. I wanted to get more involved in just the kissing and stuff. And it started off OK, and then she freaked out and said, no, this ain't cool. Let me out, threatened to tell on me. She basically told him that she wanted to stop, and, and that is just a foreign language to him because what he says goes. So when a woman challenges him, that really angers him, that really enrages him because his key objective all the time is to maintain control. So if he can't maintain control by non-physical means, he is going to be violent. It got out of hand, she started freaking out, and I begged her, I said, please don't do this, I need to screw your ride. She's like, no. I freaked out. I don't know what came over me, what kind of sickness. I freaked out. I had a wife, I had two daughters, and I had a wife, and I just couldn't see it all thrown away. Right. And I freaked out. And uh, I just wanted to just stop. She was strangled. Her body was found next to a trash dumpster uh, outside of a Houston restaurant. I panicked. Daylight came on, and I didn't know what to do. And I looked, I mean, there was 
no way to make this go away. I stepped over the line. I knew I was fucked. I knew that this is it. I'm fucked for life, and there's nothing I could do to change it. Laurie Lee Tremblay's body was found later that same day, the 26th of September, 1986. Shaw had strangled the 15-year-old with a cotton cord, which left two distinct lines on her neck. There were no witnesses, and the investigation stalled at an early stage. As far as the law is concerned, Shaw has got off scot-free. No sign of anything. There is no conclusive evidence. We're in the very early days of DNA, so the tracks were, to say the least, muddied, and there was no clarity. I was sick. I was scared to death. I was paranoid for days. I just knew this was, this was, oh, God, there's no way I could change what happened. Mm -hmm. I was sick. Yeah. I didn't want to lose everything, my wife, my kids, my house, and everything. And so I tried to appear normal the best I could, but I was in a state of shock a long time, for months. Promised myself nothing like this would ever, 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 ever happen again. Promised no fucking way. It was a promise that Anthony Shaw would not be able to keep. Over five years passed, in which Shaw later admitted he struggled to keep a lid on his perversions. After the first one, I tried not to do anything. I was having psychopathology. I know I'm familiar with that term. I tried to make myself right. Ever more promise myself this shit will never happen again. There were times when I pick up girls. It always amazed me how people just, yeah, you want to ride? Sure. And I'd have fantasies and I have thoughts, and nothing really ever came of it. But by the 16th of April 1992, the 30 year old killer could no longer contain his wicked impulses. And I ran across this really, I thought, beautiful young lady, and I offered her a ride, and she turned me down. She told me her name was Carmen, and okay. she didn't take rides from strangers, and she didn't speak in English. Maria Carmen del Estrada, always known to her friends as Carmen. She was 21, small, five foot one, only weighed 104 pounds, olive skin, almond eyes and one morning it was light misty rain and she took the ride and like the first time after that there were other occasions i gave her rides this happened over the course of probably a couple months and uh became friends with her best i could tried to bone up on my spanish so i could flirt with her and stuff and lie and said i was single and said a bunch of shit to try and make a relationship happen Shaw pulled into the parking lot of a Dairy Queen restaurant on Westview Drive in Houston. Carmen Estrada had no idea she was just moments away from being murdered. It was going OK. She was uh, amenable to a kiss. And when I pushed her further, she got out of hand and she freaked out. I didn't set out. The killer. That was not my intent. Mm -hmm. but it got out of hand. It's all right, Tommy. Tell me what happened. She even said, Hey, man, not this way. I love you. No, not this way, not here. Not this way. Oh, it's okay. I remember I opened her blouse. She was resisting. You know, I was going to have her regardless. I don't know what the hell you call it. I tried to understand this, but I wanted to possess her somehow. And my intention was to have sex with her initially, and that wasn't happening. She became real violent, just I didn't want to get out of the car. Shaw strangled Carmen to death with a tourniquet, a different method to the cotton cord he'd used almost six years beforehand. Did you use your hands on this one or use something else? Um, I want to say 
because I had fucked my hands up mm -hmm. from the first one, I used a piece of wood, a pencil, or might not have been a pencil, it was something. Might have been a paintbrush, something. Some piece of wood or something that twisted it. And it'd be in a serious panic and freaked out. And left the scene. Police said that her ligature around her neck was so tight that it, it almost couldn't be seen. It was, it was embedded so deeply into, into her neck. Just as he'd done with Laurie Lee Tremblay, Shaw left the body of Maria del Carmen Estrada in the parking lot. She was found just hours later. Investigators were able uh, to collect from beneath one of her fingernails a speck of evidence that they ran DNA tests on. At the time, there was no match. At this point in time, Shaw is lethal to women. He has been violent towards them, he's killed them, and he's got away with it up until this point. So he feels that he can behave however he likes and get away with it. Another 18 months passed before Shaw was ready to strike again. By the 19th of October, 1993, he had his sights firmly set on his next victim, a 14-year-old schoolgirl. Anthony Shore, you know, working as a telephone repairman, would be able to go in all these different neighborhoods. And so evidently, he scoped out a young girl and kind of knew her patterns when she would come home from school, if anybody else was home with her. And he just uh, decided, you know what, you're going to be next. In a change to his usual MO of attacking victims in his car, Shaw put on a bandana to cover his face and broke into the young girl's home. And so she came home from school one day. He was waiting inside the home. When she got inside the house, he tied her up and sexually assaulted her. She does everything she can to fight him off, and indeed finally does fight him off, and he screams after her. You know, you tell anybody about this and I'll kill you. Well, to her eternal credit, she kept her nerve and also kept her life. I always wondered, why didn't he kill her? And, you know, it's, it's just obvious. She didn't know who he was. She didn't know who the perpetrator was. Tremblay knew who the perpetrator was. Carmen Estrada knew who the perpetrator was. He was killing them to protect himself. He didn't have to protect himself from this girl. She didn't know who he was. He had a mask on, so he didn't have to kill her, which raises all kinds of issues. How many other victims are out there that didn't come forward? Shaw's home life was just as chaotic as his secret one. He'd split up with his wife but kept custody of his two children, Amber and Tiffany. While projecting a public image of an upright citizen, behind the scenes, he was treating his daughters terribly. Shaw's children had a really miserable childhood. He was absolutely brutal towards them. There was abuse, there was neglect. They had to eat food that had ants crawling all over it that had gone past its sow by date. They had to use the same water when they had a bath. They, their clothes didn't get washed, so when they were at school, the, the other children would make fun of them. And Shaw was acutely aware of all of this stuff. So he knew that actually by sending his children to school in that state, they would be bullied, they would be excluded. And I think there's a sadistic side of him that really takes pleasure in all of that. But he sees his children not as, as sentient beings who are autonomous individuals. He sees them as things that he owns and he has a right to treat them however he wants to. Shaw soon moved on from the breakdown of his marriage when he met a new girlfriend 14 years younger than himself, high school senior Amy Lynch. He saw her photograph in her father's house. He was attending to the telephones and thought, oh, she looks wonderful. And believe it or not, you know, she was 18. So it's almost like he's shopping and he's looking in a catalog and he's, he's selecting something that he wants. This is how he sees women. They are things to be acquired, things that he gets to own and possess. And this is exactly how he saw her. 
A new, younger girlfriend did nothing to abate Shaw's sexual deviance, which was about to reach new depths of depravity. On the 7th of August, 1994, nine-year-old Diana Rabolla left her house with $3 on an errand for her mother. She headed to the local grocery store on North Main Street to buy some sugar. So she walks down there, she buys the sugar. She's walking back, and somewhere on the walk back, she's literally kidnapped off the sidewalk in broad daylight. When Diana didn't return from the store, her distraught mother began a desperate search for her daughter. First, they went around to the neighbors, seeing if anybody had ever seen her. They retraced her steps, and eventually, you know, the police were called. There were a lot of people in the area that were aware of what was happening, aware that she was missing. Diana Rabolla had been snatched and murdered by Anthony Shaw. The nine-year-old had been sexually assaulted and then strangled with a tourniquet. It's a, a depraved, obscene crime to snuff out this young life. For what? For his sexual pleasure? Is that what's really going on all the time this is about? lust for young women. It's a tragedy. It's a disgrace. There was no direct physical evidence. You know, obviously, you know, later it was determined that she was extremely viciously, you know, raped in, in every ways that you can't even imagine what you would do to a nine-year-old girl. Diana's body was found the following day two and a half miles away from where she'd been abducted. The tourniquet, a bamboo stick attached to a length of rope, was found around Diana's neck. Diana's murder galvanized the city of Houston. And Diana became uh, everybody's young girl, young daughter. I mean, it really touched a nerve. People were really on heightened alert back then, and they didn't know what to think. And of course, there were no answers. Anthony Shaw had stooped to a new level of wickedness and once again managed to escape justice. By 1995, the 32-year-old had moved his new girlfriend into the family home. But his two daughters, 10-year-old Amber and nine-year-old Tiffany, were about to expose their father as the monster that he was. Shaw had been molesting them for years. Shaw's daughters disclosed to the school nurse that they were being abused, and this was a really big thing for them to do. This would have taken an immense amount of courage. But when Child Protective Services came round to the house to investigate further, they, they denied it. They said that they, they hadn't been truthful about this, and then it kind of went away. Terrified of speaking out against their father, Amber and Tiffany changed their story. Once again, Anthony Shaw was getting away with the most wretched of crimes. Shaw was so confident in the power that he had over his children that he never in a million years thought that they were going to speak up about their abuse. And when they are in his house, they are dependent on him. They need him essentially. So he's their tormentor, but he's also their provider. So he thinks that he's got the perfect balance here. Well, I'm sure he felt that he could walk on water. There was nothing anybody was going to do to stop him. And soon, Anthony Shaw would kill again. On the 26th of June, 1995, 16-year-old Dana Sanchez was reported missing by her mother. Ten days later, on the 6th of July, the teenage runaway was approached by Shaw. He had this look that she was angry and upset, and she was at a payphone. She started storming off, and I was making the corner. I just said, hey, would you like a ride? And she says, man, I'm going to see my boyfriend somewhere. I forget where she told me. I said, hey, no problem. And jump right in. And she told me her name was Ruby. Why she told me that, I don't know. I remember she told me her birthday, and we went driving. And she was, then we had a conversation, and I had this same soup, famous soup crap going through my mind, and I was flirting with her heavily. 
that time I had really long hair. I thought I looked good, maybe I just looked like a freak, I don't know. But she was real friendly. Shaw claimed that he pulled his van into a parking lot and began to try and kiss the 16-year-old. She's sort of a savvy woman. I mean, she's not naive. So she sort of said, look, I got a boyfriend. I don't need any of this. That didn't do anything to mitigate his actions. Uh, it just emboldened him. I grabbed her, pulled her into the back of the van. And then she fought. She bit me hard. Blue blood, I forget. My chest, I want to say. Mm -hmm. So I restrained her, tied her hand, and she was fighting so hard. And I was getting sick about this whole thing. This is so fucked, and I didn't want it to happen. And once again, I knew that I couldn't stop. I knew there was nothing I could do to get out of this. And I used a ligature. Shaw strangled Dana with another makeshift tourniquet made up of nylon rope and a toothbrush before driving her body towards a remote field. I was getting sicker in my brain. I just, I wanted this shit to stop. I didn't want to keep doing what was going on. I couldn't, I just knew that I couldn't get caught, but I wanted it to stop. So I drove and drove and drove and drove. I pulled her out into a field, like a bat out of hell, scared to death. Unlike his previous victims, Shaw dumped Dana's body in a less public place. Eight days later, she still hadn't been discovered. Here's the egomaniac part of Shore. You know, he was pretty much, what I understand, a news junkie. He would follow the news. And I guess he didn't see any news on this. And if you're going to commit these types of murders, you're going to want credit. And so he actually called an assignment editor at our NBC affiliate, KPRC. And she recognized pretty quickly that the person calling her that was giving her clues as to where they might find a body was the actual killer. I changed my voice, and I remember telling him where to find her. And I told him her name was Ruby, and I told him what her birthday was. But I identify her. And there was a part of me that just wanted to be caught mm. and stop. On the 14th of July, investigators headed out to the secluded location where Shaw had told them to look. They actually, you know, went out there looking around, and sure enough, there's the body of uh, Dana Sanchez. And, I mean, it was, you know, keep in mind, when a body's out in a field for a week, it's not going to be in very good condition. And it was just a horrific state that her body was found in. It appeared that Anthony Shaw was now gloating. Despite investigators linking the murders of Carmen Estrada, Diana Rabolla, and Dana Sanchez due to their similarities, a task force failed to find a suspect. In 1997, Shaw married his girlfriend, Amy Lynch. It was an apparent fresh start for the 35-year-old, which meant there was no room for his daughters from his previous marriage. Shaw decided that he and Amy should begin their married life, in a sense, on their own, and dispatched his daughters, Amber and Tiffany, to their grandmother in Sacramento, California. Shaw had no idea this would be the beginning of his downfall. While in California, the two girls finally felt brave enough to speak out about the sexual abuse they'd suffered at the hands of their father. And I think it was Tiffany, who's the youngest, told her aunt, you know, daddy's been doing these things to me. So then the aunt calls her mom, grandma, and says, look, uh, this is what Tiffany just told me. So then grandmother goes to uh, Amber and says, well, what do you know about this and this? And then. Amber spills the beans on her dad. In January 1998, Shaw pled no contest to two charges of indecency with a child. He had molested his own flesh and blood for almost a decade, but he escaped imprisonment. These girls are saying that their father drugged them, raped them, 
assaulted them, exposed himself to them. What do the authorities do? They give him a $500 fine and eight years probation, but they do place him on the sex offenders register. And, and significantly, very significantly, they take his DNA. Shaw lost his well-paid job, and by 2003, he and Amy were divorced. He hadn't killed anyone for eight years and was seemingly laying low. But unbeknownst to Shaw, a new investigation into the deaths of Carmen, Diana and Dana had begun. So by this time now, you had three murders that were basically kind of lumped in. And you had detectives at this time that decided to form a cold case task force between the Sheriff's Department and the Houston Police Department looking into these unsolved cases. Could be the same killer. Let's get together and work on it. In October 2003, 11 years after the murder of Carmen Estrada, detectives revisited the DNA that was discovered beneath her fingernails. By now, you have more advanced technology. DNA is much you know, better than it was 10 plus years ago. And again, they send the sample off. And this time, CODIS gets a hit. And bingo, bango, everything explodes. On the 24th of October, 2003, Anthony Shaw was finally arrested for murder. DNA under Carmen's fingernails was a match to the 41-year-old. He was arrested, taken into custody. He waived his Miranda rights and just uh, and, and gave his confession. You have the right to terminate this interview at any time. You understand these rights? Yes, sir. OK. Do you want to waive those rights? Yes. Tell me what happened? Yes, sir. OK. During open and frank interviews with detectives, Shaw confessed to the murders of Carmen Estrada, Diana Rabolla, and Dana Sanchez, as well as the 1986 killing of Laurie Lee Tremblay and the rape of a 14-year-old schoolgirl in 1993. The reason that Shaw confesses is partially because he wants the acknowledgement, he wants the recognition that he's the one who's committed these crimes, but also there is an element of wanting to control the narrative, because by confessing, by giving his side of the story, it's his version of events that is going to stick. He silenced these victims, they're dead, they can't speak anymore. So by seizing the narrative, by becoming the storyteller, he remains in control. After getting away with murder for so many years, Anthony Shaw's vile crimes had finally come to light. Well, he was charged with capital murder. The reasons are very clear. They had DNA, they had a confession. Uh, that was an easy case. That was a bing bang, we got you. Eventually, they, they charged him with the one murder, officially. That's what he's charged with, capital murder of Maria del Carmen Estrada, because that's the one they had the most evidence on because that's the one you had the DNA. And they decide, as a capital case, they're going to seek the ultimate punishment. And in Texas, the ultimate punishment is the death penalty. And the death penalty in Texas is carried out. In October 2004, Anthony Shaw was due in court, charged with capital murder. In his confessions to detectives the previous year, the killer had claimed that a malevolent force had driven him to take the lives of his victims. When Shaw is confronted with his crimes, he says, I have evil in me. I have to keep the evil at bay. As if some dark hand stretches up into his body and squeezes him and says, you must kill innocent young women. I don't know if you call them demons. People talk about voices in your head. Mm -hmm. I like other voices, almost like my own voice, like there's a demon. I'd see some girl walk in and I'd invite her. And I have fantasy trips. 
I think this, this is very kind of poetic, it, it's very symbolic, but you've got to look at what it does. It detracts our attention away from the fact that he decided to do the things that he did. When he's talking about this idea of inherent evil, we are kind of conjuring up images of something that's beyond his control, but he very much knew what he was doing. The first part of Shaw's trial would determine whether or not he was guilty of the capital murder of 21-year-old Carmen Estrada. Considering Shaw had confessed to killing her, it would be a near impossible task for public defender Gerald Burke. It was very clear from the get-go we weren't going to be walking out the back door with a not guilty. They had the DNA. They, they had it locked down. Uh, you know, our experts agreed with their experts, so here we are. There was no, you know, Anthony Shaw might be innocent. He was guilty. And sure knew it. Every, so it was kind of anticlimactic, the trial. Most capital murder cases are pretty lengthy, and I've been to many of them. But this one was over in one, two, three days. It was over. It was what you would call a slam dunk. Anthony Shaw was promptly found guilty of the murder of Carmen Estrada. The trial now moved into the second stage, which meant the 14-year-old girl who was raped by Shaw in 1993 would come face to face with her attacker once more. In Texas, you have two parts. You have the guilt and innocent part, and then you have the punishment part. And the punishment part is where you can bring in all the extraneous other offenses and anything about Shore's character. And they actually had the young girl, who at that time was in her 20s, testified as to being sexually assaulted by Shore. And she was on the stand she was able to identify. And it's very rare that you have someone who survives a serial killer. It's not often that people survive that, and yet, yet this brave young lady was able to do that and point to the person that did this to her. During the punishment phase of the trial, Shaw's daughters also took to the stand and spoke out against their father and former tormentor. I seem to remember the only times that I really saw emotion was when his two daughters were testifying. And, and uh, I remember, you know, tears in his eyes, welling up in his eyes. I would say from, from a lawyer's standpoint, sitting in the courtroom, you know, it was, it was a surreal, surreal moment. Lots of thoughts are running through my mind for the girls and for him and what's he thinking and does he really know now what he's done to them, how it's gonna play out, uh, what additional damage is being done to them at this very moment. As the punishment phase of the trial progressed, 42-year-old Shaw seemed resigned to his fate. I think he knew what the outcome was gonna be, and I think in his own mind, he actually thought that he deserved to be put to death, because I've not seen in other cases, I've not seen where someone just lays down and just says, do what you want with me. At least there's some sort of, you know, I'm going to fight for my life. He didn't even fight for his life. On the 21st of October 2004, the jury were ready to deliver their verdict. The jury, you know, goes back to deliberate whether or not they're going to give him the death penalty or life. I mean, seriously, I could have gone down the cafeteria, <clears throat> ordered a grilled cheese, and come back, and the jury was ready. It was that quick. Within an hour, which is almost unheard of, they came back and gave him the ultimate punishment, which was the death penalty. And I think Shore pretty much was resigned by that time. He was going to death row, where he belonged. Years later, while on death row, Shaw admitted to carrying out many more heinous crimes. He then confesses, in the wake of his conviction, to 60 further rapes. He's clearly been um, a sexual predator of the highest order over many years and throughout that area of Texas. And I think there's, there's definitely an element of, of numbers here. And 
these offenders will get competitive. They will want to be seen as the baddest, the, the biggest, the most prolific. So I think that's what's going on here. This is his narcissistic element coming through again. He wants recognition for all of these evil things he's done. 14 years after his conviction for murder, 55-year-old Anthony Shaw was finally given an execution date. Victim advocate Andy Kahn had a front row seat in Huntsville, Texas on the 18th of January, 2018. Now, unlike TV, here's what happens when you're in the chamber. Anthony Shore at that time is already tied down, strapped in on a gurney. It's not like you see, you know, dead man walking, you know, where they march somebody in, and, and it's not like that at all. It's very choreographed and concise. Journalist Mike Gratchick, in his role as a media witness, was also in attendance. I remember that his voice was choking as he was giving his final statement. And in the statement, he just, he said he was sorry. And that no amount of words could undo what he had done. And he said, that's all, Warden. And uh, at that time, the lethal dose of uh, pentobarbital begins. Well, I remember he kind of in a very southern fashion, ooh-wee, or, you know, he made out some weird, you know, ooh-wee, I feel it, I feel it, and, and that was it. At 6.28 p.m. local time, Anthony Shaw was pronounced dead. The man who ruined so many lives had finally been laid to rest. And then they asked me to address the media on behalf of the families. And I had the pictures of, of the four girls. And I just said, this is their day. This day is about Lori, Carmen, Dana, Diana. I said, this is not about Anthony Shore. This is about these four young girls. This is why we are here. And I, I remember saying, the reign of terror of Anthony Shore is finally over. We can all breathe a sigh of release. He will no longer harm anybody again. And all these families can go to wherever their loved ones are buried or kept and say, justice is finally served on this day. Shaw continually got away with murder for over a decade before his deception was undone by the two people he thought he had full control over. His daughters, they're the real heroes in this situation. They don't even know the lives that they have saved. You know, let's assume they don't come forward. Then what happens? Anthony Shore is still out here. We don't have his DNA. We don't know who he is. He may still be alive running the streets and, and doing things to young women. They're the heroes. They literally saved lives. Anthony Shaw preyed upon the young and vulnerable. He would try and worm his way into the lives of his victims, and when his feelings weren't reciprocated, he would squeeze the life out of them. He destroyed the lives of strangers and also his supposedly nearest and dearest. Shaw was a dangerous sexual predator who will be remembered as one of the world's most evil killers.